Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar entitled Broadband 101, the second in our broadband leadership series co-hosted by Illinois Extension, the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society, and the Illinois Office of Broadband. We welcome Bill Coleman and Adrian Furness from the Benton Institute of Broadband and Society. They provide education and assistance to those Illinois communities planning for broadband adoption, use, access, and equity. And we'll be giving remarks today before welcoming our panel of presenters. Before turning it over to Adrian, I want to encourage participants to utilize the chat space to ask questions at any time during the presentations and discussions. Bill will be facilitating a Q&A and later this afternoon, I'll send a follow-up email to those who registered for today's session with slides and handouts and the recording. Okay, I just wanna say thank you again to everyone on the call and um, our presenters and wonderful partners. And I will hand it over to you now, Adrian. Well, thank you, Nancy, very much. And I want to always begin by thanking our collaborators in this webinar series and in the Illinois Connected Communities Program. So um, thanks go to Illinois Extension who hosts these webinars and acts as a partner for us throughout the year, hosting webinars and doing so much more, including um, Illinois Extension professors working with individual communities that sign up for the Illinois Connected Communities Program. I of course couldn't go further without thanking Matt Schmidt from the Illinois Office of Broadband. And I also want to recognize two people on this call who staff our Illinois Connected Communities Program. Many of you know Bill Coleman, our community coach. Uh, and I think most uh, everybody who at least has been involved in the program knows my colleague at Benton, Robbie Macbeth, who is joining full-time uh, say, or half-time, I should say, with Bill to work on um, uh, outreach in all of its various forms. We do have some um, Illini Science Fellows who will be uh, also working with us. And that uh, also is a service that the University of Illinois and the Extension Program provides uh, to the program. This is our second year of webinars. It's also our second year of the Illinois Connected Communities Program where we put communities through, maybe that's not quite the right word, but we do work with them for a year to put together a uh, broadband strategic action plan that focuses on the needs of um, our particular communities um, whether it be uh, urban neighborhoods in Chicago or small rural communities uh, or counties in the state or um, economic development regions um, or school districts. And so there are a variety of partners, 12 that joined us for round one. And there was uh, recently an announcement about our eight communities that are joining us in round two, again, a wonderful mixture of programs, um, uh, applicants and uh, their interests. So this is a really important webinar because Broadband 101 is the second thing we usually talk about. The first seminar, which is available on the Illinois Extension website, talks about uh, the community role in broadband development. And uh, that seminar was a couple of weeks ago. This one really tries to give you the basics. Um, and I think that what Bill would say is it takes a few times to maybe go through this webinar to feel like you have a grip uh, on all the different kinds of broadband. And we have wonderful speakers with us today. So I wanna thank them ahead of time. Don't feel bad if you come away from this with more questions than not, we're here to help is the most important answer. And I loved what one of our communities said to us at the end of their 12 months. One of our leaders said, I'm gonna to come to these seminars again because six months in is when I really started to click in on my knowledge 
And I feel like it's always good to keep refreshing and keep up with what uh, uh, what's going on. And so we welcome back. I noticed some of our round one participants are here today. And of course, we welcome all of you new players who have joined us. And we're up to now over 50 participants. And so with that, Bill, um, again, thank you so much for being the leader of this program. Bill's just done an amazing job. And I hope everybody who's been through the program enjoyed working with him. And those of you who are starting, uh, I know you'll have a great experience with Bill, Robbie, and the rest of the team. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, my role today is, is uh, small. I just want to uh, start us off, and then I get to introduce our very knowledgeable uh, presenters. Um, as community leaders, uh, thinking about all these technology questions, I deal with the township officials, county officials, school districts. They never thought that they would have to become broadband experts as part of their uh, daily duties. But it turns out that this is such a foundational piece of uh, delivery of services now that uh, uh, it has come front and center for them. And we know that uh, we just heard uh, in the banter prior to the seminar starting, somebody saying, well, this isn't my language. And broadband does have its own language and whether people can't even agree whether we're talking about broadband or high-speed internet is uh, two different things and how we need to message on that. Know that as a community leader, you don't have to be a, a broadband, a technology expert to be a broadband or technology leader in your community. You just have to have the persistence and the willingness to uh, investigate and uh, uh, choose good partners and, and so on. We know that there's uh, uh, certainly wired technologies in terms of you know led by fiber optics and to a lesser extent uh, cable modems with the uh, 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 their different wiring systems or telephone through DSL, which has it's a different uh, set of wiring. Uh, we know that there's many, many, many flavors of wireless and uh, involving uh, different technologies and different spectrums and, and so on. Uh, it gets very confusing. And uh, then now satellite uh, used to be kind of a one flavor fits all, but now there's multiple flavors of satellite and we'll learn more about that today. I encourage that if you're new to the broadband discussion to not try and necessarily understand all the details, but to try and create a framework in your mind about which kind of buckets the different conversations go in. And if you can kind of get a little organized in that way, you can uh, and understand some basic concepts uh, about things like uh, wireless that uh, low frequencies go far but don't carry much information. That's how we talk to saddle or to uh, submarines about uh, uh, nuclear codes and so on. You don't need to know a lot of information but it needs to get to a very far place where high frequencies carry lots of information but not very far and they don't go through buildings uh, very well. So if you can start to get a feel for those kind of overall concepts uh, as you work at this more, you'll be able to start to put uh, these uh, uh, concepts into a, a usable framework. When we think about broadband technologies, we want to understand how they work for us. And so if you think about uh, speed uh, for broadband, you know that there's uh, the download speed that everyone talks about uh, as a primary measure. How fast is that information coming to us? And that's a, certainly an important concept. We've learned uh, through the pandemic with the emergence of video conferencing uh, being commonplace from homes going from never doing a video conference to having three or four people doing video conferencing at a time we know that that upload speed from you to the network is uh, even more and more important. Traditionally, we know that uh, networks have been designed to deliver content to us. 
satellite TV, cable television, and so on. And so the upload speed was less important, but that certainly has changed. If you look at the data, the idea that people are downloading much more information than they're uploading is correct. That still is true. But for a good share and a growing share of people creating content themselves, as well as doing the video conferencing has really increased the need for that upload speed. We know that affordability is really next on the uh, charts in terms of uh, priority. It doesn't do much good to have uh, networks running by people's homes that they cannot afford to connect to. And affordability is an interesting concept. As someone who runs a business out of my home, you know, it doesn't really matter that much what the price is for me, whether it's $50 or $100 or even $200 a month. It's such a critical part of my business that I'm willing to pay that. For people who are tr trying to choose between uh, groceries and internet or heat and the internet, that affordability is a much uh, more critical piece. At the same time, the more that we can show people how to use the internet to as a substitute for cable television, as a substitute for uh, going out to a movie, or as a substitute for getting in the car and driving three hours for a doctor's appointment, that affordability issue becomes a lot, uh, 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 you can really build on the value that communities get, that individuals get uh, from an internet connection. We know reliability is important. The more you use broadband, the more important it is that it be reliable, that it be there when you need it. And uh, in the old days, when we used to have to make a lot of copies at an office for grant applications and so on, we always knew that the copy machine would fail at the most critical time. And that we don't want that happening with our internet. Uh, and so to have that internet when you need it is important. And for some businesses, the idea of uh, being offline could be millions of dollars per minute of, uh, of lost time. Uh, Delta Airlines, for example, or other large data centric companies, that reliability is a critical issue. For me, for a home business, I'll just go out and take a walk and hopefully it will be back up when I get in. Uh, maybe that isn't as critical, but it certainly, we know that when kids are trying to do homework, and or, or being in a class and the internet does not work, it's a very uh, uh, stressful situation. Mobility, the phone, the iPad that goes wherever you go, uh, we know that that's something that people want. A lot of times we think of that, uh, many times people say, uh, well, uh, people of lower incomes, they just want a mobile phone uh, for their connection. Well, we know that's a fallacy. If you can afford uh, connections, then you have multiple ways of connecting, a, a fixed connection, mobile connections, multiple devices, and so on. But mobility is uh, uh, certainly a, a critical part of this. And one of the things you'll learn today is how these systems work together. That it's not a question of one or the other technology. It's how do these technologies work together? And then latency is an issue, and that's really the delay it takes on signals, uh, uh, upload and download and so on. And we know that fiber is super fast, and we know that uh, a, a traditional satellite, one of its main issues is the latency issue uh, because it takes a, a long time, relative long time for a signal to go up to a satellite and come back down. But so when we think about assessing technologies, you really want to think about what's good enough for your community. Uh, based on these uh, standards of uh, the FCC, uh, the federal standard of this is a definition of what broadband is. So it's a minimum of 25 megabits down and three megabits up. So, uh, and, and so if it's less than that, if somebody's trying to sell you a 10 megabit broadband connection, you can let them know that that's not, that's, it may be internet, but it's not broadband. Likewise, uh, Illinois has broadband goals, uh, 25 down and three up by 2024, 
and then a more ambitious goal of 100 megabits down and 20 megabits up by 2028. And so as you think about the technologies you'll hear about today, think about do these meet the standards that you set, uh, that the government has set for these things, or uh, it's, it's, how's it gonna be for the long term for your own community? And so these are the uh, things we're gonna talk about today. And I'm gonna end this show. So if I can do all this in the right order uh, and uh, stop sharing my screen for a minute. And then I'm going to uh, introduce Jeff Brown. And Jeff is with Calix. And Calix is a, a national, international firm that uh, is involved in the fiber optics industry. Uh, we have Jeff Brown who's going to join us. I've had uh, a number of folks from uh, Calix over the years participate in these seminars. And uh, uh, today is Jeff's first appearance on, on my screen. But after having a good call with him the other day, I think we're uh, going to have a great presentation about uh, uh, fiber optics and, and uh, uh, the, uh, the capabilities and the technologies that are involved. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody. Um, so happy that everyone could take some time out of your busy schedule. Hopefully this will be very educational and entertaining. So uh, let me talk a little bit about um, fiber optics and broadband more generally. Um, if we could go- Jeff, before the... you get going, could I just ask Nance, how's this, how does this look on the screens? Perfect. Okay, good, thank you. Sorry, Jeff. No, awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, so dovetailing on some of the, the comments Bill made about, if we go to the next slide, where we actually talk about what the challenge and the opportunity oh, is. Oh, I need All to All right, that sorry, one. let me <laughs> uh, stop that. Yeah, basically what that map shows is, uh, and you've probably seen some mapping initiatives out there that demonstrate the, uh, the need for more broadband uh, across the United States. I guess the key point I'd make there is that, you know, the 25-3 the number that was mentioned, 25 downstream, three upstream, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a, um, a benchmark that's being actively discussed, you know, within regulatory agencies, within the government. There's a strong argument. I'll talk about this a little more about the uh, upstream portion of that being, being antiqu antiquated. Uh, because of just changing, you know, behavioral norms. Um, and I would urge you to think about broadband similar to how you think about your infrastructure initiatives, not just for the needs of today, but going forward, right? If you were in the business of planning roads and highways, you know, for your community, you wouldn't think about the minimum amount needed just to serve the needs of the traffic today. You'd be trying to think forward and anticipate uh, what type of, um, what, what's the appropriate type of infrastructure to meet those needs. Um, Bill, if you want, I can share too. If no, I'm just, I just okay. had to turn those. So I just wanted to get them all turned. Awesome. Okay. Well, we can go to the one, the next one after that. Just a quick uh, background on, on who Calix is. So we work with, uh, those who operate broadband networks. That's all, those are the only type of entities that we work with. So uh, municipalities, utilities, broadband service uh, uh, providers, what we will call BSPs, broadband service providers, over 1600 that we work with globally. Um, we have over 150 gigabit com communities, as you can see a number of them here. And we don't sell at all directly to end users or enterprise customers. You won't see any of our offerings in uh, big box retail stores. We're actually head headquartered out of Silicon Valley. And I actually happen to be here in Illinois. I happen to be in Naperville. I've been with Calix over three and a half years with a long track record of working with other broadband service providers before that. We can go to the next slide. So, uh, as, we, as government and private funding have become more available uh, to spur broadband network build, you know, basically uh, are developing two types of, uh, of network operators. One who are building brand new greenfield, what we call greenfield from scratch, 
networks and others that we would call um, expanding existing infrastructure that is placed, what we kind of typically call brownfield. So we work with all of these BSPs or broadband service providers, whether they're a for-profit or a nonprofit entity to help make sure they understand how to take advantage of all the different stages that are involved. You know, if you think about how to start a business first, there's that, there's that funding portion, right? It could be private funding. There's a lot of government funding, which we could spend a whole topic on that's available out there. Then the actual design of that network, some very key decisions involved in the architecture of the actual network, the building portion of it, right? Everything from the layer one, the physical plant to some of the um, more up the stack type of uh, inside plant type of decisions that need to be made. Of course, operating and supporting it and then marketing, which is very important. So not only does Calix work with these customers, but we have a rich ecosystem of partners that we work with. So consulting engineering firms, you know, like Finlay, a strong partner of ours that we work with that help. We educate companies like Finlay so that they can provide the solutions to the different entities to be able to kind of make those the best decisions for your particular situation. So this is a, a key slide here when we talk about, I've used this over the last 15 months or so, right, as we've gone through the pandemic and I, I do numerous webinars with all different types of uh, organizations and uh, customer segments and and uh, hopefully, you know, if there's anything that you, that you take away from this, it's some of the key things that have really changed. These were behavioral changes that were already kind of underway, but were accelerated by the pandemic. And, there, and, and all sorts of statistics are showing that there's no signs of those abating. So when you think about on the left there, it's not just about um, the work from home and the e-learning or learn from home that was also taking place, but it also to some degree highlighted the nature of it's not just how much broadband you use, but it's also where you use it, right? Uh, how many of you yourselves have experience that need to not just use your broadband like sitting at your desk where you normally might, but also because of the number of people in your household in more remote stretches, you know, of your of your actual lot, right? Maybe even outside on your porch or your backyard. So the importance of a whole home Wi-Fi experience is very critical to giving uh, customers that total experience that they're really looking for. The second on the middle there is the continued um, move of content to what we call OTT or over the top or streaming, right? So when you think about people uh, whose job is to build an access network, a broadband network, um, for the most part, you know, 10 years ago, even five years ago, a huge portion of the video content was going over a separate pipe into the home, was going over that RF pipe, that coax, right? Increasingly, people are doing what you call cutting the cord, and that trend is unabated where you're seeing the content that was, that was consumed over the RF pipe is now having to go over the broadband pipe. So if you think about that going forward, and the business models for these different kind of uh, uh, cable operators, how they're moving to a broadband first type of business model. As, an, as, a, as a network planner, someone needing someone need to architect to make sure you have enough uh, capacity into the household. Essentially what you're seeing is both the video and the data content increasingly moving over that single pipe, that broadband pipe into the home. And then on the right, you know, this is a trend, right? At every trade show or conference you go to, they'll ask, well, how many connected devices do you have in your home? And that continues to explode, right? That's growing uh, uh, exponentially. And, but it's not just about the number of connected devices. It's about the type of applications they're using, right? A very wide variety, some um, very low speed polling regularly. You think of uh, security video cameras. Uh, others requiring a very high amount of bandwidth, low latency, a lot of the new applications coming. So it's essentially creating uh, an issue where the home network is much more complex than it used to be, and it requires the right type of platform to be able to manage that appropriately. So to kind of punchline, there's some key statistics that have come out. This is very recent, Open Vault tracks um, uh, broadband usage across the United States. This is a first quarter readout. 
upstream consumption grew 60%. So when you think about that, that 25.3 number, three meg for upstream traffic, is that really going to be enough based on the uh, type of applications that people in the household are using? Think about video conferencing, what we're doing right now. Think about uh, IP cameras, uh, ring, et cetera. 80% uh, of broadband subscribers across the US now have a package of 100 meg or greater, 80%. And 10% now have over a gig. And that number increased almost three times last year. So you're seeing a huge preponderance of multi-gig offerings out in the marketplace, many offered by munis and utilities themselves as a way to kind of differentiate themselves and set themselves up for the future. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so the, you know, the takeaway is that uh, um, applications drive bandwidth demand. If you look kind of carefully at that, there's, there's a build in here that I tried to take away so it wouldn't be so busy. But you could see you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, central left, uh, the person on the bike, right? You think of just one example, Peloton. Peloton didn't even really exist just a few years ago or no one really knew about it. There wasn't any sort of mass market adoption. You think of ring cameras. These are all exact uh, examples of applications that just a few years ago didn't exist. If you move that forward just a few years, think about all the other applications coming down the pipe that are gonna drive increases in, in bandwidth. So consumer applications are driving enormous need for bandwidth. There's lots of creativity out in the marketplace um, as people increasingly do some form of work from home, it's gonna drive even more um, a need for greater bandwidth. Jeff, excuse me for a minute. We have a question in the chat. He says, are we talking about the same thing? 100 meg of use isn't the same as 100 megabits per second download. So, Oh, on this particular side? Yeah, these are examples of the actual application itself and the amount of data it consumes. Uh, uh, every time it sends traffic. So I wouldn't get too hung up on this. I think the point is overall, when you think about that single uh, broadband pipe that's going into the home, it's needing to handle a wide variety of applications, um, sometimes at the same time. If you think about prior to the pandemic, the normal peak time traffic usage in a typical network was between eight and 9 p.m. in the evening. That got flipped around last year where the peak time now is during the day, right? If you think about all the work from home usage, right? So now what you're seeing is some changes where people who model their access networks need to accommodate those type of, um, well, I'll say fluctuations, right, in, in traffic and make sure that they have enough both on the access side, but then the other part that I'm not gonna talk about here that we deal with broadband operators a lot is on the aggregation side, going back to your, you know, your key data centers where you get to the cloud, where you get to your, your, your Netflix cache or whatever, uh, you know, the type of compute that's gonna go out on the core network. So hopefully that answered that question. Um, in terms of economic development, I could throw a lot of slides up here that talk about the increase in in home values and jobs. Um, and we can do that in an, another session here. I've uh, got examples of uh, communities that we've worked with. Um, there was a PC Mag just came out with their top 10 ISPs. A few of them are, are uh, municipalities that work with us. And they've you know, anecdotally told us um, about the uh, huge increases in economic development, about making their community more attractive to bring in uh, people in, particularly in some states where there, were, where there was a, um, a, a, a export of people moving out of the state. Um, I guess the bottom line here on this one is that is that when you think about broadband, increasingly you need to think about it uh, almost as a utility. It's becoming as important as electricity and water for for a number of people, particularly you know if you think demographically about the the younger generation who's kind of grown up with the smartphone and the internet. It's just as important as uh, and be, and would be considered on par uh, with the utility um, and critical, right, to the ongoing needs of your daily life. Uh, next slide, please. So why fiber? Uh, I kind of rolled up three big things that I could get technical about into one bullet point, which is reliability, scalability, and security. 
Um, it's extremely reliable if designed with the right type of architecture. Scalable meaning there's almost unlimited bandwidth that you can have. It's certainly the desirable technology, the ideal technology. There's no argument about that. You know, if economics were no factor, fiber would be deployed absolutely everywhere. Uh, there's been studies that talk about from a, a smart grid uh, perspective, the reduction in power outages by trying to leverage uh, fiber networks with the smart grid, which I think you'll definitely see as, uh, as, a, as sort of a ongoing type of development here in coming years. And then if you think about the path to 5G, right? So you've got these, uh, what we call MNOs, mobile network operators, right? Your AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, US Cellular, who are out deploying their 5G networks, right? You're bombarded with those ads all the time on television. Um, those are wireless cell sites and they call them small cells, very, very small deployments that sometimes sit on on, uh, on poles and traffic lights. Well, all of that traffic that's going to those cells has to be aggregated over fiber. That requires very robust fiber infrastructure. So to be able to um, attract those type of, of 5G, what we call cell densification efforts, uh, it's very important to be able to have that type of fiber in place to service those needs, which gives you the high speed bandwidth you need, the right amount of low latency, and then another topic which is increasingly important, the, the timing that's required to handle, handle mobile network applications. And the last point that I'll talk about is this is a low operating expense, sorry for the acronym there, OPEX network. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I'll show you a study that talks about how fiber can cost less over the long term. Now, I want to be real clear here. I work with a variety of operators um, who are all trying to deploy broadband all across the US and globally in other countries as well, where it's even a uh, more difficult issue, right? Uh, because of coverage and things like that. So there are, there's without a doubt, there are going to be um, what we call use cases or corner cases where a, a fixed wireless connection to a very hard to reach place, think about a, a smattering of households up against a mountain, that absolutely makes sense and that works well and that can work and interoperate very nicely with a fiber network. But overall, if you had your choice, if you were going to think about um, planning and architecture for the future, similar to my, my kind of road analogy that will be able to handle the traffic over the long term, uh, make sure and consider the operating expense of the network because the fiber network is significantly less expensive than other technologies and in particular compared to say the coax uh, HFC or cable network um, that's prevalent out there with cable operators and the fixed wireless network. Um, next slide. Um, okay, so in terms of what consumers want, this is a kind of a busy slide, but it talks about market share based on the actual access technology and you can see the blue is the fiber adoption rate. So. Uh, this is consumer only, right? This is not businesses. So it was non-existent um, back in 2006. Uh, there was almost no fiber to the home and you can see where it's grown uh, to 20%. If you look at all the numbers on the chart, um, they're either static or they're decreasing. The one that's exploding is fiber. Uh, there are about 50 million homes passed now in the US. Obviously we have uh, a lot of runway there to uh, increase that. But if you could, were to kind of graph that out further another five years or so, or even 10 years, where do you think the adoption rate is going to be? So clearly, uh, fiber is the most desired. It gives you um, the most feature and functionality, bandwidth, low latency security um, compared to any other technology. Oh, Jeff, can you, uh, uh, there was a question in the chat about the high costs of fixed uh, wireless uh, operations and maintenance. Do you want to just? Sure. Yeah. I mean, well, we work with a lot of what we call wireless ISPs. We call them WISPs. Um, so there are about 20,000 out there in the U.S. And predominantly the, um, the barriers to entry are establishing line of sight or what we often call hubs or towers. So you try to find um, a, a, a tall piece of infrastructure, 
somewhere where you can set up your essentially your your networking hub from a fixed wireless standpoint that can have line of sight so that you could reach out to all the individual end users. Now, uh, in some more rural type of applications, that can often be a, a grain silo uh, or other more creative uses of, of, of that. But it's the um, uh, the acquisition costs for the land, the right of way easement, et cetera, that's involved in that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think the radios too, you have to change the radios out more frequently. And well, our next speaker is gonna talk fixed wireless, so he'll- Yeah, um, actually, yeah, I, I, would, I would say radios can be very, very cost, cost effective. Um, um, and, and like I said, I don't, I'm not in any intent to badmouth uh, fixed wireless whatsoever. I think it's got a great place for certain applications. I just think if, you're, if, if, if you were to try to plan out for the future, your desirable architecture would be based on fiber. Um, so this is about PON networking standards. So PON is a point to multi-point standard that utilizes a single fiber with no um, powering on either end. So it's extremely cost effective. You don't have to have all of these elements uh, powered in, in the middle. And it has the attributes as close as you're going to get in what I would call a layer two environment to this pure, you know, sort of routing layer three environment. So PON's been the de facto architecture for access uh, for uh, most industries uh, across the board globally. Um, the, the type of standards that you'll hear about here, I just wanted to share it because there's some kind of buzzwords that you may run into a lot. The one that has grown the most is what's called XGS PON, X stands for 10. So it's 10 gig symmetrical PON. So it's 10 gig upstream and downstream. That um, um, Del Oro re recently came out and said that uh, the adoption rate on that, adoption by operators deploying it is at 500% year over year and the quarter before that it was 400%. So it's growing four or five X, it's becoming the sort of de facto standard, very, very hugely popular. And GPON2, is uh, adopted by uh, Verizon, uh, their partner of ours, customer of ours. And uh, that actually has some really great feature functionality with tunable um, optics. However, it still hasn't been adopted uh, widespread in the market, pri primarily because of the inherent high cost of the optics. Um, okay, so what should the vision be um, when you think about how to plan out your, you know, we'll call it your broadband grid. The idea would be to try to have a one access network to be able to serve everyone's needs, right? If you work in the broadband space, uh, traditionally there are a number of different, um, different networks all sitting next to each other. They'd have a, a, what you might call a CIPRI network for mobile backhaul, a point to point, a dark fiber network, then upon network. Um, so the, the industry is trying to move, you know, for, for efficiency purposes, right? To, if you're going to make one investment, it should be able to cover all the needs of your industry. And it can interoperate very seamlessly with these last mile wireless applications. You can see the example there of the, uh, the, the um, um, lights and the, the windmills and 5G. So the idea is that if you think about it more as your, as your infrastructure platform where all the traffic needs to aggregate to, to then get out to either the internet or to your cloud providers, that's a, a desire to be a fiber infrastructure. And the most efficient way to deploy that is with a pond network. So I do wanna leave you with and I'm cognizant of time here. I do want to leave you with one thing to think about. We can talk about uh, you know, in, a, in another um, session sometime, but uh, when you talk about this concept of one plus one equals four. So we work with all these different operators who, who focus on putting this great broadband network into place with the right type of symmetrical speeds, with the right latency, but then their, their customers, the end users, subscriber in home, the small businesses, et cetera, will say, I'm still not really getting this great broadband experience. And that's why it's important to not just have the broadband access infrastructure in terms of the fiber network, but also that 
whole home Wi-Fi experience needs to be very tight. You need to put some thought into how you're going to provide a whole home Wi-Fi managed experience because the end user, the subscriber, they equate it as one is the same, right? How many of us have ever heard someone say, oh, the internet's not working? Well, it could be the Wi-Fi, right? So we've got all of these statistics where the vast majority of the time, the problem is actually in the Wi-Fi itself. So getting that whole home experience where you have a great broadband in every room, um, it, it's very important to be able to focus on that in addition to the actual broadband itself. So to want to leave it with uh, one little um, anecdote here from Jimmy Kimmel, if you had to choose between the running water and the Wi-Fi, you'd obviously focus on the Wi-Fi. So uh, think about both the broadband uh, technology itself in terms of fiber, fixed wireless, et cetera, but also think about the Wi-Fi that's going to be what we call kind of call behind the DMARC inside the customer's prem uh, when you're talking about putting together that great digital experience for your, for your customers. Yeah, thank you for your time. Um, I'll check the chat here for any questions. Uh, okay, about cell providers. I, do I have time to answer that, Bill? Sure, go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, so for the most part, the, when we talk about fixed wireless access, uh, there's a whole variety of different types of ways to do it. But most of the what you'd call the traditional fixed wireless access providers out there are using unlicensed spectrum. Increasingly, that's changing. There was 4.6 billion uh, in, in the recent CBRS auction. But, but for the most part, when you run to a fixed wireless access provider, WISP today, they're using unlicensed spectrum out there. So they actually have to go out and obtain, you know, if they were going to move into a market, they'd have to be able to obtain uh, those line of sight for their hubs. Um, and they wouldn't have access, they wouldn't have existing towers. Good. Hopefully thank that answers. That. And up next now is, uh, thank you so much, is a great uh, presentation. Really appreciate it, uh, Jeff. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bill. And uh, Jeff, if you want to put your, if you want to put your contact information in the chat or a Calix website or something you recommend and, and I uh, appreciate that. Next up is, is Chris, uh, Chris Konichi of uh, Finley Engineering. And Finley is a consulting engineering firm that uh, works all around the country on all kinds of technologies. Uh, and uh, Chris has really been an expert uh, on the fixed wireless and uh, other wireless technologies as, as they've emerged and improved over the last uh, several years. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Bill. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with everyone here today. Um, I'll get my slides set up. Let me know if you guys can see that. Looks perfect. Great. Uh, yeah, and just to touch on what Bill said, we are a telecommunications firm. We've been around since the early 1950s. Uh, our roots are kind of in the old telephone uh, world, but as, as voice has increasingly become an app and, and the shift has been to broadband networks, uh, we, we've adapted and evolved over time. Um, I would say the majority of our work is with uh, telcos and deploying fiber networks. However, you know, recently within the past seven years or so, we've, we started to see a lot of interest around fixed wireless. And that's why we've kind of jumped into that market uh, as well. So what I want to do is just kind of give you an overview of, of what fixed wireless is and, and kind of talk about some of the components and questions and answers that, that go together when these networks get deployed. And I'll try to kind of maybe address some of those questions that were in the chat and elaborate on those a little further. Um, I wanna start off with a story. This is about a small telephone company in Minnesota that we work with. Uh, they had 300 customers in their exchange, you know, their telephone exchange, a very rural area. They were all built out fiber of the home to those 319 customers. Um, but what they started to get was there was people two, three, 25 miles away that, that needed service, but 
there was no one there to bring it to them. So what they hit upon was a, a fixed wireless network, and that really leveraged their existing core electronics, and they would shoot out wireless links to various you know, structural elements in the community. If it was a, another water tower, uh, you know, more of a traditional guide tower, and even some of those creative solutions like grain bins and, and just houses on a hill. And they blew up with over 600 customers inside of 18 months. So you think about doubling your business base in 18 months with a very minimal infrastructure investment. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty tremendous growth to go through. Uh, so much so that they started to stress that network and kind of hit the limits of what that technology was capable of. Um, and then the next step was they started backing those network sites up with fiber, connecting them to their core fiber network. Um, you know, as Jeff talked about, all internet traffic's got to hit fiber at some point. It's got to go back to the larger internet to get it to its final destination. Um, so with those improvements, they were able to offer increased speeds and um, I think they're today, they're at about 2000 customers, which if we go back to 2015, you know, that's, that's still a pretty tremendous growth rate and they're offering, you know, pretty, pretty competitive speeds at 50 and, and even in a few cases touching that hundred megabit mark. Uh, so when we talked about fixed wireless and what it is, um, I want to make a couple of distinctions here. When we say fixed, that means a fixed location on either end. So you've got a dedicated antenna on a tower and a dedicated antenna on, on a building somewhere. We're not talking about mobile services. Um, recently, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile have been kind of relabeling their services as a, as a home or fixed type of service. Um, Oftentimes what you get with that is some sort of puck. It's not a, it's not a hard installed antenna on the side of your house. And the issues with that is when you have, you know, that puck or hotspot inside your house, you've got to shoot through all the walls and shingles and siding of your house. So that degrades your signal. Um, that's either a, a, a plug in with a wall wart or a or a, or oftentimes even a battery powered device so the power and the rf characteristics of that device just aren't enough to do what a purpose built fixed wireless system can do uh, and then we'd have to get into the how mobile handoffs and things of that nature work and we'll just kind of sum it up to say that that fixed wireless networks when properly built can often outperform those dual purpose networks. Um, the other thing I'll talk about is point to point and point to multi-point, kind of that bottom graphic there. Uh, point to point is, is like a walkie talkie where I send on one side and I receive on the other side and they, they just talk back and forth. Uh, it's a, it's a one-to-one -one connection. Point to multi-point is, is that one-to-many uh, connection. And that's what you'll often see um, when it comes to last mile infrastructure. And that's often the, the limiting component uh, when it comes to fixed wireless networks. Uh, as I said, Finley was not that heavily involved in, in fixed wireless networks just a few years ago, but really the, the technological improvements and the speed enhancements that have come along have really made this a viable, you know, short-term solution, I would, I would call it. Um, what's driving that is a few different things. Uh, it's movement towards standards-based technology. You'll hear LTE and now 5G and, and Wi-Fi standards. Um, this is driving down base component parts, if they're chipsets or what have you. And it's also allowing interoperability between systems. So if you think about a fixed wireless network, I've got to hang this antenna array on a tower. That stuff fails or goes bad within six to seven years. Maybe there's something better out there. And, and there was no backwards compatibility. So you'd not only have to go change out the equipment on the tower, but you'd have to run around to all those rural homes and, and forklift off that equipment on the home as well. 
it's a really significant capital expenditure and it maybe drives to some of that uh you know total cost of ownership 10-year outlook uh that jeff had alluded to in some of his earlier slides um some of the other things that that have have come along in in technological improvements you'll kind of see some 5g buzzword precursor type things that have crept into the market um increasingly not just wireless networks but everything's becoming more software defined that just means faster time to market uh it is easier to do things like backward compatibility um and also you'll see things about uh mimo and beam forming and and what those technologies do is uh in the bottom corner here you'll see kind of an old school what we would call an omni antenna that would blast out signal kind of equally in all directions. Um, with, with MIMO, we're able to talk on multiple channels. So it's effectively multiplying the amount of data that you can use given a, given a standard spectrum allocation. And it also allows us to do things like beam forming. So what that does is it's, you know, you hear about interference and how that's a bad thing, but this is basically think of it as constructive interference where I can flex signals to whoever's using the most data to provide them the, the strongest signal at any given time. And it, and it really is powerful in, in high density environments. Uh, we kind of hinted around it a little bit here, but we'll get into 5G a little bit and, and what that is and what it means. Um, when we talk about 5G, it's, it's kind of hard to explain um, because it's not just a single thing. 5G is kind of the next evolution of 4G and previous iterations of radio access networks. Uh, the big thing is, is it's software defined, hardware flexible, and it's use case driven. So it may not be, you'll see these performance targets down here it may not be all those things at any one time. It may only be pieces and parts of those as the use case determines. So, you know, you may need a, a very high speed link for um, large data file transfers, for um, redundant route for backhaul, things of that nature. Um, you know, if we talk about like a stadium setting with millions of devices, you might need that high density uh, use case and, and, and the mobile use case. Um, if we talk about IoT, we're maybe talking more about energy efficient sides where we've got lots of devices scattered over very long ranges, but you know they're battery operated and, and we're just passing very small packets of information along. And then last, you, you've got low latency applications for things like self-driving cars, telemedicine purposes, things of that nature. And what those things are really doing is they're taking advantage of the 5G draft specs that are put out by uh, 3GPP. And, and here we kind of have a timeline below of, of when that is. So right now we are in what they call release 17. Um, that basically means that there's devices out there on the market they're continuing to add functionality through these, these consecutive releases. Um, the long and the short of it is, is that, and we'll get to this in a different slide, is, is it depends on how 5G is being used. If you're in an urban area and, and they can use some really high spectrums and take advantage of the properties of those, you're gonna see those crazy high speeds and it might cut into, um, you know, a cable or a fiber provider's market. If you're in a rural area where it's not cost effective to, to cover those distances with the, the number of towers and network sites required, you're probably not gonna see that dramatic shift in speeds. Um, when we talk about successful wireless networks, there's a few things to think about here. Um, Number one is cell density. So that's kind of, you know, how many network sites do I have per square mile, per subscriber, et cetera? You know, how, how close am I to all these endpoints that I'm serving? Uh, another key consideration we'll get to in the next side is, 
is spectrum selection. Um, Jeff kind of touched on this about licensed versus unlicensed. Um, you can kind of think about it about talking in a in a crowded room versus you know talking on on a on a private phone line. Um, when you're in these unlicensed spectrums, you're sh you're sharing frequencies with anybody else that wants to operate there, and the rules are very very loose about you know what you can do and what you can't, and, and enforcement is even more lax uh, from the FCC. So what we've seen is is a lot of traditional telephone companies or broadband ISPs have been reluctant to get into fixed wireless because they can't guarantee that they've got that uh, spectrum to broadcast on and provide that high, uh, highly reliable service. Um, with things like the CBRS auction, we are seeing more telcos get into this. Um, spectral efficiency, uh, now that you've got your cell density and your, and your spectrum um, you know, worked out, how do we maximize what we can do with those assets. So proper design of antenna arrays, frequency reuse, all the parameters that go into that, um, a well-designed network, just like a well-designed machine um, does its job much better and much more efficiently. And then the last piece, uh, I'll hit it again, backhaul, and, and the difference way that that can be done. Um, our preference is always for fiber. Uh, however, that's not always possible, and, and you need to to factor that in where you can. Chris, could you just define backhaul? Sure, backhaul is, if you go back to that first slide where I kind of had that point to point connection, it's taking all those, those one to many connections that are gathered at a, at a single network site or antenna location and, and aggregating that traffic and pushing it towards the larger internet. And, and there's different you know, ways to do that. A little we bit about do, hops. Yeah. So. So a lot of times what you'll see is, um, is, is wireless operators will chain together multiple point to multi-point network sites. Um, what that does is every time you, you hop your, or go from one tower site to the next before you hit the core of that network, it introduces more latency. latency. It's another chance for failure. Uh, you know, if it's an equipment failure, uh, a weather event, a power failure, whatever that is, it, it can it can impact the network. And then also you're you're aggregating more traffic. So when we see networks that have multiple hops, um, often that's the problem. And, and in, in Lismore's specific case, they were running into that very issue. And by taking fiber to their sites, we alleviated probably 95% plus of their, of their problems on their network. So that's, that's where we see a lot of problems with fixed wireless networks is in the backhaul. Uh, to talk about this slide, just real briefly, Bill even, even hit upon it in, in the opening segment. Um, there's different frequency bands that we can operate and, and they broadly get categorized into low band, mid band and high band. Um, the best, uh, equivalency I can give you is, is, is the radio in your car. If we think about the old AM mega stations that would broadcast for miles and miles and states away, um, that used a very low power, uh, or a very low frequency, um, signal to broadcast on. And as such, it can handle trees. It can even shoot you know, past the curvature of the earth if you want to get into it, how it bounces. Um, in contrast, FM stations, much shorter range, but the audio quality is, is drastically better. So you kind of see that in fixed wireless networks that, yeah, you can use some of these lower frequencies and shoot a long ways, but as you shoot farther and farther out, you're touching more and more subscribers or potential subscribers. So you're asking that network to do more and collect more traffic, but it can't do as much as a higher frequency could do. So it's kind of this compare and contrast of, of using the right coverage for the right situation. 
Um, where do we see these networks being deployed? Uh, there's kind of a couple of main um, use cases. Number one is, is if we see this a lot is, you know, somebody has got a big fiber network and they want to gather uh, other customers that are just beyond their service territory. So I can set up a tower at the end of my fiber. I can shoot out another six, eight miles. I could grab another couple hundred customers. Um, the next would be what, what if you already have fiber at towers? Um, we have a provider in Minnesota that we work with. Uh, they had service to 30 towers in about a six county area. They were providing fiber backhaul for Verizon and T-Mobile and AT&T. So they already had the most expensive part, the bones of a, of a good fixed wireless network set up. All they had to do was put the equipment on the towers and reach out to the end users. They, they rapidly grew that business to the point where we kind of joke that they're, they're a wireless company and not a fiber company anymore. Um, Another strategy that we've seen uh, networks get deployed at is maybe there's a company that has built fiber to, you know, kind of the low hanging fruit or, or the low cost areas, and they don't know how to get that last five, 10% that are really high cost built. Fixed wireless networks can kind of help close that gap. Um, and last would be a higher level of service. You know, it's, it's hard to cut a wireless link like you can cut a fiber. So We've seen fiber and wireless combos kind of redundant paths, redundant routes into buildings. Um, some network challenges and where, where uh, fixed wireless networks can kind of fall down. Um, we talked about this earlier, line of sight or near line of sight required to get those good speeds, that 25, 50, and even 100 meg that, that's now really doable on fixed wireless. Um, you really need to be able to stand where that piece of equipment is on the house and with your eyeball see, see to, the, to the tower. Um, there's definitely terrain and topography that play into this. Uh, where I live in Minnesota is, is you know, cornfields as far as the eye can see, and there's not a lot of trees or rolling hills that, that can uh, impede a fixed wireless network. You know, Illinois is kind of a good mix of, of farmland and some maybe more rugged country as you get along the Mississippi. Um, it just kind of depends on what area you're in and, and what spectrum you're using, how successful you can be. Uh, interference levels, that comes into play if, if we're talking about, you know, unlicensed spectrum. Uh, subscriber density, antenna locations, those are all just factors to kind of take into account that will drive an overall um, business model. And the last things, uh, reliability, it's pretty good. Um, I won't say that weather won't impact it, but it's it's very unlikely. It's, it's a pretty reliable last mile solution. Um, and last is aesthetics. You know, if you've seen some of these these 5G uh, mini cell type operations and they're trying to put them on, uh, electric poles and street lamps, um, you know, depending on the neighborhood, that might not be the most pleasing thing to the eye. Um, and then just a few things about what to expect and, and what these, these networks are really capable of. Um, this can obviously vary more or less, but on average, we would expect uh, a fiber fed fixed wireless network to be three to five times cheaper than a, than a comparable um, full fiber to the prem network. Uh, that, that could get higher if you're dealing with, with areas with a lot of rock and, and other issues. Uh, it could be lower depending on, on what assets you have. Um, I would say that, that 50 and possibly even 100 meg is doable within a six to eight mile radius. Um, things that impact that is subscriber density. Are we dealing with licensed or unlicensed spectrum and how much spectrum do we have access to? There's a lot of, there's a lot of parts that go into kind of trying to derive what a, what a max upload download speed are. Um, 
talked about whether it doesn't affect operation. Uh, another piece that feeds into that total cost of ownership piece is for one reason or another, we really think the equipment lifespan on this is in the five to seven year range. Uh, part of that is due to, we see home broadband usage triple, um, or I think it's double every three years. So it's, you know, 50 or 100 meg is good for now. But if we extrapolate that exponential curve out, how long is that 50 or 100 meg good for? Do we need to move to a new product? And then the other piece is the FCC has been very progressive in, in pushing out new spectrum blocks. There's new equipment coming out all the time. And, and then the stuff is living out in the elements. It just fails. So for those reasons, um, it's, it's a higher cost of ownership. And, and then last, I'll hit it again, uh, backhaul options. How do we, we take that product from these point to multi-point radios and pull it back to the core network and up to the larger internet? Making sure you nail that piece is, is really important. And I think that's, that's all I have. I think you're muted, Bill. There's one quick question about the, again, the performance of the, the big guys and their fixed wireless products. Um, mm -hmm. And just anything about, the, you know, it's talking about, you know, 2510 from AT&T and T-Mobile at 60, uh, but by one. And any explanations for those, and especially on that T-Mobile side, that low upload? Sure. Um a lot of these networks are built around uh, LTE chipsets. So if you, you know, before 5G, it was 4G LTE. Uh, and really what that is, is when, when mobile traffic first exploded, it was all download. It was all, I want to, I want to get, uh, you know, picture, picture messages, or I want to watch a video or, or that sort of thing. There wasn't a huge, amount of consumption in the upstream direction. And as such, all these chipsets that they're trying to take advantage of with economy of scale and all those factors, they're all built for download. It's just, it's just kind of, you got to run the horse you brought with. Um, that's to go back to the beginning where we talked about mobile versus fixed. A purpose-built fixed wireless network can do symmetrical speeds. So, um, the one thing I'll say is, is fixed wireless is, is if you think about a pipe, I can shoot up and down, but if I shoot more, if I pull more down, um, that means I can shoot less up on that same amount of spectrum. Uh, when you combine that with the inherent disadvantages of an LTE or a mobile built network, it kind of compounds. Okay. Thank you so much, Chris. It's really great, really interesting, and I think just right at the uh, perfect level. So uh, thank you so much and uh, really appreciate your help. If you want to put your contact information into the chat, that would be great. Absolutely. Thank you, Bill, and thanks, everyone. Next up uh, uh, is uh, uh, Steve Mesnick, and Steve is uh, an officer with uh, uh, Biosat, and satellite is something that is uh, getting to be uh, more and more and more a, a, a viable alternative and uh, performance is improving. So, uh, Steve, welcome. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. All right. That's the first step. And then, oh, good. It looks like you have my presentation. You saved me the trouble of figuring out Zoom. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> I'll get that up here just on the big screen in, in just a second here. So, Okay, great. There go. Nancy, how's that? Or do I need to swap? Looks good. Okay. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'll give you a, a brief overview of Viasat um, for a few minutes. And then what I want to make sure to get into is there's a couple of topics I think, Bill, you would ask me to cover a discussion a little bit about, um, you know, Viasat's in the geostationary satellite business. Uh, there's LEOs and other types of satellites. So I want to make sure I cover that. And I think I wanted to leave some time for 
Q and A. If anyone here has questions, ask through the chat. Uh, Bill, I'm sure you'll ask me as well. So I like to try to keep it as interactive as we can, but you don't hear me drone on and on for a while. But um, let me get started uh, with uh, Viasat Overview right now. So uh, as you can see, we're a global communications company. Um, we basically, the, the concept with Viasat has is everyone uh, in the world should be connected to the internet, right, one or the other. And so that's kind of what the charter has been since uh, 1986. So if you go to the next slide, thank you. Um, you know, we're on the ground, we're in the air, we're at sea. I'm going to give you examples of where Viasat operates. Go to the next one. Okay, so uh, founded in 1986, actually, our, our founder is still our chairman of the board. Uh, and we've been around and we went public um, in, you know, in the, I believe in the 90s. We've got about 45 offices currently around the world, and that will expand uh, as we continue to build our global constellation of satellites. We're a little over $2 billion in, in revenue currently. Um, and you can see the offices uh, throughout the world where we operate, a lot in the U.S., but we're expanding now much more in Europe uh, and then the uh, APAC region over the next five years. Okay, so up in the air. So we provide internet service to commercial airlines. So for example, uh, United, Delta, JetBlue, uh, American Airlines, uh, just those are just domestics. We're on several international uh, carriers as well, Finnair, LL, SAS, uh, and that continues to grow. It's a big part of our business because though satellite internet might oftentimes be viewed as a kind of last resort or, or something more for unserved or underserved communities, right, on the ground, in the air, uh, we believe we have, you know, the equivalent of, there was a lot of discussion recently, you know, from the last two speakers on fiber. We're kind of the equivalent to, I'll call it fiber to the airplane, right, in terms of the speeds that we can manage. So a really growing business for Viaset there. And the same thing for business jets. Uh, for private jets, we are kind of the best option available for the fastest speeds um, that you can get on an airplane. And then that parallels well into we provide connectivity to many of the VIP government aircraft. I won't go through all of them. You can imagine which ones I'm talking about. Um, the most important ones, the ones that you know can fly around uh, endlessly up in the air and be able to do you know run the country from from the airplane. Those are the kind of uh, airlines that we or excuse me airplanes that we provide service to and a lot of other military type transports as well. So that's the air. And the ground, we provide service to homes. So consumers, we have about 600,000 consumer homes throughout the United States we provide service to, and then also small business. We are not, you know, we are not getting people who have access to fiber or high-speed cable. Our market is really those who are quite out, you know, a little bit outside that area where you have those fixed terrestrial, you know, options. So a good example, everyone always thinks, oh, it must be very rural. But if you go look at maps of cities, what you'll notice is you'll just have this neighborhood that sits just outside where the cable company or the fiber company decided to put infrastructure. And just from my background, I spent time at Verizon before I came over to Viasat, and I worked on the Fios business. And I know specifically that they would draw a line and say, it is only profitable for us to put fiber out this far. And once you get to a certain distance, it is no longer profitable. There's not enough density in the homes to do so. So they stop laying fiber, right? And that's where a service like Viasat uh, becomes very valuable for those folks who have no other option out there beyond that point where the cable or telco decided not to in, uh, invest. And then, so business and the community internet is another interesting one. Uh, we've started and we're growing, and this is less in the US, but I just thought you'd find it interesting. In other countries where people don't have nearly the the ability to spend money on broadband that uh, folks do in the United States. Um, we had to find a way to make the service significantly cheaper. So what we're doing in community internet, which is we put a single terminal up in the central area in a village or town, and we're able to provide uh, via Wi-Fi internet service to people at very low cost. I mean, they'll, they might get on the internet for 30 minutes and pay 25 cents, right? A very different model than we're used to in the U.S. where people pay hundred hours a month for their own dedicated you know network here people just need to be able to get on very cheaply for a limited amount of time get on get off do what they need to do and then move on and so that model that community internet model is something we're doing in africa we're doing in mexico we're doing in brazil we're doing in many of these uh other countries throughout the world and then lastly at sea uh, cruise ships right those who are on a cruise ship know internet has generally been kind of awful uh, on cruise ships we believe we have enough bandwidth to actually provide a very good service similar to an airline. Now, a cruise ship is 10 times the size of an airline, 
uh, but we can put more capacity aimed at certain uh, cruise ships. So we're in that business now as well as yachts and, and Navy ships. So those cover uh, the areas, the customer segments that we target at Viasat. And then this is a very similar thing showing, you know, if there's anything else I want to hit on here. Um, again, private aircraft, I talked about uh, the unconnected, uh, making it affordable for people throughout the world. So this, again, is just we're both in consumer business uh, and military. We can keep going. And so here's an example. So we basically have the fastest U.S. satellite-based home Internet service. We offer 100 megabits per second uh, across many markets. Um, as I said, we have about 600,000 subscribers. Almost all the plans we sell now are largely unlimited plans. And what I mean by that, though, is unlimited means there's no overage charges. We don't shut a customer off when they are done with, when, you know, if, if they've hit a predetermined allowance. But I'll tell you, the satellite um, does have, a, I'll call it a limit to the volume that we were able to uh, provide. So you'll oftentimes hear there are, you know, after you use a certain amount of high speed data, your service will slow down when the network is congested. So that's one of the differences to understand it is, you know, as I said, it's not competitive necessarily with fiber or cable, okay, but it's really good for those people who don't have that option, who are able to utilize, you know, who want to browse the web and they want to be able to do apps. Uh, streaming video, we can do a certain amount of it, but it's not the perfect service for those folks who just want to cut the cord, uh, go get themselves a Roku device and stream, you know, video 24 hours a day because their kids just leave the iPad running, you know, throughout the day in the house. So. It's a wonderful service, but there are certain limitations. And I always like to be upfront and honest, you know, who is it for and who is it not for? Um, we mentioned business and I mentioned the shared internet service. So uh, I'm gonna talk in a few seconds about the innovation in we have in the technology. So here you go. So we've built, uh, we have five satellites currently or four satellites in orbit. Our fifth one is launching in 2022. And these are all geostationary satellites. That means they sit 22,000 miles up above the earth. and they provide service back down um, through, we have a ground network, the satellite network. And so our newest innovation, Viaset 3, which is launching in 2022, has uh, about a terabit of capacity for each of the satellites. We're gonna launch three of them. And if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see the idea is with three geostationary satellites, we could largely have completely global coverage. So if you're an airline and you wanna fly from the US to China, you wanna, you know, go through multiple time zones, we'll be able to provide service all the way across. Or maybe more importantly, if you're the military and you get into a conflict in a place where you there is no existing network for you to go utilize, you basically have to bring your own network if you're the military going to certain places in the world. We'll be able to provide connectivity to our military um, department of defense wherever uh, they need it. So we started construction uh, in December 2015, actually on the satellite. Um, we are completed construction. We shipped it actually to Boeing, um, uh, I think in the last couple of weeks. And so the interesting part about a satellite is, you know, we build it, we ship it to Boeing. They basically connect it to their, the infrastructure that allows the satellite to fly in, in outer space. And then we have partners um, like a SpaceX, for example, that we partner with or Ariane Spas, others who launched this satellite uh, into orbit. It's quite the show if you've never seen a satellite launch. And we expect that to launch, as I said, in early 2022. Okay, so re quick recap, and then I want to get into some questions that Bill had asked me to cover. Um, you know, we're basically a global communications company expanding throughout the world. Our first Viasat 3 satellite will cover all the Americas, North and South America. Our second one is going to cover uh, Europe and Africa. And the third is going to cover the Asia Pacific. And so within the next, I'll call it three years, we should have uh, a new fleet of satellites covering the entire planet. Okay, I went through that kind of quick. Um, you can close that out. So I want to talk about LEOs for a minute. Uh, Starlink is probably the one folks hear most about. Uh, so the difference, as I said, a geostationary satellite is 22,000 miles up. LEO satellites have a very different idea. They're at a much lower, they're low Earth orbit satellites. They are at, you know, call it 500 miles, 750 miles. They're, they're at much lower altitudes. And the idea is for geo, you can see, as I said, a geostationary satellite can provide coverage to a third of the planet. Just one satellite can see a third of the planet. Uh, LEOs need thousands and thousands of satellites in order to be able to cover the planet. Now, the trade-off, people tell you, is a LEO uh, has a kind of lower latency, right? They are closer to the Earth. It takes less time for a data packet to travel back and forth. 
than it does to a geo. So you can get kind of lower latency. Uh, however, you need a significant number more of satellites to cover the Earth. So we've always believed that the most efficient way to provide large amounts of data to customers is a geostationary satellite. LEOS has its place too for very important, where latency is very important, first shooter gaming, certain um, VPNs, right? There are certain things that do require, I'll call it lower latency. That's where a LEO is a great solution. But overall, in terms of, I'll call it efficiency for uh, lowest, let's call it dollar per gigabyte of data, uh, geostationary satellites are, are much more efficient uh, than LEOs. And so Starlink is, and, and I think you've seen Amazon, many there's going to be uh, a few LEO uh, networks that are supposed to be built. As Elon Musk will even tell you, many of them have always gone bankrupt. So we'll see if these are the few that, that don't. But I'll tell you, I think the, I don't believe this is kind of a zero sum game. There are so many households in the US, probably about 20 million right now who just have very poor access to any internet connectivity. And so we could build a ton of satellites. Starlink can build all the satellites they want. Amazon could, and we probably still won't fill the demand that folks have for internet connectivity that can't be serviced by fiber or cable. And especially if you move outside the US, there's even less infrastructure like fiber and cable in many places, India, Africa. And so those are the places where I'm very confident that satellite technology, whether it be Leo or Geo, is gonna largely be the, the necessary technology to provide those places because they just don't have the infrastructure that we're lucky to have here in the United States. Despite how bad we might think it is, it is way better than than some of the other countries that I spend time with. So I want to hit on that. And then, uh, Bill, did you have any specific, I want to make sure I cover all your questions before uh, we get into Q&A. I think that was great. I was going to just ask you about with your new satellites, will your upload download speeds then be enhanced? I see your total capability is the service. Yeah, the so two things. Yeah, well, total coverage increase. And I know we'll be able to do speeds up to 150 or higher. And actually, we could do even higher speed. It's really a trade-off of, well, you know, there's a certain amount of capacity. How much do you want to use to give max speed versus how much do you want to do to be able to give people more data or more coverage? So speeds will increase, uh, both download and upload significantly. Right now, generally on our satellites, we offer for consumer customers up to three, for business customers up to four and five. Um, We'll see, I'll call it five-fold that probably on Viasat three, significantly higher upload speeds as upload becomes more important. As you and I sit here, I'm using upload to talk to you. Um, we continue to, and it's a, it, these are dynamic satellites where you can choose to provide more upload, maybe the expense of download, so the trade-offs, but yes, you'll see a significant increase, exponential increase in the upload speed. Good, well, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions. And so yeah. if people have those, that would be great. I know that uh, if people are living, I live in Minnesota, you've got the North Woods. Uh, uh, you know, having that clear path to the sky is certainly important, but at least your satellite stays in one place where the other, the low earth ones are moving around. You have to cut more trees to maintain your vision. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's that's one of the interesting things about these LEOs where they, you know, you're you're let's call it, you know, talking to one satellite and then it moves after five minutes and you have to kind of connect to the other one. So it, it does uh, the newest solutions that you see out there now will even tell you, hey, you're going to lose connectivity for a period of time, which it's easy to put down, you know, in your marketing material, say, oh, just, you know, sporadic uh, connectivity issue. But when you're doing a call like this, right, you can't just be out without Internet for a minute. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah. Steve, you said you had customers in about, you know, in most of the counties in Illinois, but that the fact that you don't have customers in some places isn't a matter of your coverage. It's just that you don't have customers. Is that right? Yeah, no. Yeah. We pretty much, if you can see, I'll call it the Southern sky. I think it's like 59 counties in, in, in Illinois we have coverage in. It's just, there are certain places where maybe they have, maybe it's the most dense, or, you know, area in, in the state and, you know, people have fiber and cable. And so we're not the necessarily the best solution for them there. So it's not that they couldn't get it if they wanted to, it probably doesn't make sense for them to buy our service compared to the other options they have. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. That was the only uh, question I saw. I'm, I'm really excited to have uh, 
you present today. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so thank satellite you. People, power. satellite is one of those things people don't really know that well about. So I really appreciate you giving me an opportunity to, to you know, share some of the, I'll call it misbeliefs. People still think it's a 10 foot dish in front of your house, right? Mm -hmm. That re That is required for satellite. So thank you for the opportunity, Bill. You're welcome. Happy to have you. Uh, we're kind of almost right at our time. Uh, so I want to uh, talk about this series a little bit. Now we have two more or three more uh, webinars as a part of this series. And that uh, next uh, time is really about uh, uh, some of the tools and best practices in public private partnerships. And we've got a good uh, uh, one excellent speaker there who's going to really spend some time and, and dig in and uh, Joanne Hobus is her name with CTC Energy and Communications. And Joanne is uh, uh, affiliated with the Benton Institute and is seen as a national leader in this uh, field. Two weeks after that, we're talking um, case studies, uh, trying to focus on Illinois projects that are, have been successful and, and show the way for communities to jump in. I think we'll talk more about some of the federal money that's available as well uh, with the, uh, the American Recovery Act uh, dollars, as well as some of the NTIA and other programs. And then finally, our fifth webinar focuses on uh, digital inclusion, uh, digital equity. And we'll talk about the programs that communities can use to overcome some of those cost and knowledge barriers that so many people have uh, yet today. So with that, uh, uh, I don't have anything more. Adrienne, do you want to say anything or do you? Have... No, I just want to thank our speakers, Stephen, Chris and Jeff, who I think did a terrific job. I always, I've been 10 years in this business and I always learn things. Excuse my phone. And I just want to thank you all for being here and for being so good at keeping it sort of on the broadband 101 level. Um, and again, Bill, thanks for lining up these terrific speakers. Appreciate everybody being here and, and everybody hung in. So I also appreciate that too. Thanks, guys. And thanks to Nancy. Our recording will be up uh, and you'll get the link to the uh, presentations and uh, encourage you to look back at the series uh, uh, that there's a lot of content on there. And so as you uh, are driving around or uh, uh, sitting out in a screen porch, you can uh, uh, continue your broadband knowledge. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day.